Hey y'all, it's me, Kevy. For the past few months, I've been requesting a ton of queer books through NetGalley. So for Pride Month, I could have a whole bunch of queer new releases to share with y'all. I read a variety of books, from children's picture books, to self-help, to even cozy mysteries. Let's get right into it. Super Gay by Jesse Hersey is a picture book written for kids just learning how to read. With its pride-themed superhero protagonist, it teaches kids about pronouns. It doesn't get into defining what a pronoun is, but I figure that makes sense given the book's demographic. Instead, it just jumps right into she, her, he, him, as well as singular they, them. The book even presents characters with multiple pronoun options, he, they, or she, they. Super Gay ends with the message to celebrate love in all its forms, short and sweet and to the point. The design of the titular character Super Gay is good. I love how colorful she is. I also like the drawing of the party scene at the end, as well as the various pride flags placed throughout the book's backgrounds. I really like this book, especially as the news is currently full of people trying to ban children from learning about LGBTQ plus identities. It's more important than ever for these books to be providing queer education. This book is very much a starting place. It is by no means exhaustive, but it's not meant to be. A book like this can open up conversations and encourage further reading and education, and I'm all for that. The Big Gay Book of Pride Flags by Jessica Kingsley is a great reference guide. Many people get overwhelmed by the amount of different queer identities and pride flags there are out there. This book explains the meaning behind each of them with easy, accessible language. It explains the history of the original pride flag and the ways in which it has evolved over the years from removing to adding stripes with different new meanings. There are also some possibly lesser known identities included in this book, such as demisexual, polysexual, and intersex. So not only will you learn about various pride flags, you'll also learn more to understand different people's identities. The Big Book of Pride Flags was illustrated by Jem Milton. Their art style for this book was really pretty. I loved the way they showed each flag in multiple ways. First, there's the big one at the start of each identity, and then they'll represent it on little triangle banner flags, or on a hanky in someone's pocket, or a t-shirt. They also show a variety of people, so they really can see that queer can look like anybody. I think that will be a great educational moment. The book also ends with a blank flag that the readers can color in so that they can take pride in whatever they love. Overall, I think this book is an excellent tool for teaching kids about queer identities and can even be helpful for an adult looking to learn more about queer people. When I first heard about Me and My Dysphoria Monster, I was already eager to read it. Then I became even more excited when I realized it was written by Laura Kate Dale. I've read some of her grown-up work, and I really love her writing. Me and My Dysphoria Monster is an empowering story to help children cope with gender dysphoria. The book does an excellent job at this mission. In very few words, the author managed to convey this complex subject in a way that young kids would be able to easily understand. This book will do an incredible job at helping young transgender kids understand their experiences and how to express them to the other people in their lives. Me and My Dysphoria Monster is illustrated by Hui Chiang Eng. The art style of this book is magnificent. Our protagonist, Nisha, is just adorable, and her dysphoria monster is looming and ominous without being too scary. The book also comes with a reading guide for adults, providing a list of definitions for trans-related terminology and answers some questions for the grown-ups in trans kids' lives. This will be a helpful resource for parents, guardians, families, teachers, and other caregivers, especially if they are new to learning about transgender people. I am thrilled that this book was written, and I will be grabbing a copy for all of the children in my life. This may come as a surprise to some of y'all, but autistic people are significantly more likely to be trans than neurotypical people. There's a huge portion of the transgender community that is neurodivergent. I think a book like this, The Awesome Autistic Guide for Trans Teens by Yen Perkis and Sam Rose, is an excellent resource for young people who may be just discovering their own neuro or gender divergence. The Awesome Autistic Guide for Trans Teens is a straightforward read, easy to understand for someone first learning about trans and autistic identities. It is concise and to the point, 
and can easily be read in a single sitting. Acting as a starting point or a first resource for its intended audience, this book contains a plethora of definitions for various identities and even repeats them in a glossary in the back of the book. I appreciate that this book acknowledges the discourse around person first language versus identity first language. Many large organizations, such as Autism Speaks, which is a hate group by the way, trying to eradicate autism rather than supporting autistic people, preach that we must use person first language, person with autism, rather than autistic person. However, all of the autistic people that I personally know or have talked to on the internet say that they prefer identity first language because their autism is part of their identity, much like their sexuality and gender. This book explains that distinction and encourages the reader to choose which they prefer. One of my favorite parts of this book was the list of trans and autistic celebrities and notable figures. Having a list like that is important for an introductory text like this, so that the reader can know about specific people who are like them and that they are not alone. It gives them people to look up to who they might have otherwise not known about. Throughout the book, there were activity pages, encouraging the reader to do some self-reflection about the subject of the chapter. If utilized, these pages will help the reader better understand their own identities. One thing I wish this book had touched on was the prevalence of self-diagnosis in the autistic community. Self-diagnosed autistic people are embraced by the autistic community for many reasons. Getting a diagnosis can be difficult, especially when many of the diagnostic criteria are discriminatory against women and people of color. There are a lot of autistic people that go undiagnosed, and this would be a great tool for them if they knew their self-diagnosis was valid. Overall, I think the awesome Autistic Guide to Trans Teens is a book that could potentially help a lot of people, and I'm glad that it's being published. I don't read self-help books very often, but Queer Body Power by Essie Dennis is my kind of self-help. It is all about the intersection of queer identities and fat phobia and the unique experiences around this intersection. This book contains many important lessons, including identity is not intrinsically linked to your partner. This is important to understand for bisexual individuals whose identity often gets erased based on who they are dating. Conversely, this could apply in a situation like a lesbian dating a trans man. Just because she's dating a man doesn't mean she's not a lesbian and doesn't make him not a trans man. That is still their identity. The difference between disordered eating and eating disorders, as well as explaining what normal eating behaviors look like. Food isn't moral. It isn't good or bad. Food is neutral. Social media discriminates against queer content creators, especially if they're plus size. I myself have had so much of my content deleted and removed just because I am a fat person comfortable with showing a little skin. Meanwhile, a thin person can show their entire naked ass and that doesn't even get flagged. Most big name clothing brands and designers discriminate against plus size shoppers, rarely carrying anything over a size 12. And then the selections available to bigger people are basic and boring. Support small business fashion because oftentimes they are much more inclusive with their designs and are willing to go the extra mile to make sure their things fit correctly. I have been blessed to model for many of Chicago's queer designers, such as Sky Kubaku from Rebirth Garments and Kaylee from An Authentic Skidmark. These designers prioritize fashion for people who are queer, fat, trans, and disabled. When you can, buy from designers like these so you can wear clothes that make you feel confident, comfortable, and even sexy. Queer people often use tattoos to express their identities. That is very much true in my case too. I have the stretch marks on my stomach and up along my back tattooed many bright colors. I see this as not only a celebration of my fatness, but my queerness as well. I think one of the most important lessons in this book is to fake it till you make it. Dennis reveals that even while writing this book, she was struggling with her internal monologue against the fat phobic voices that have been planted in each of our heads. Despite this, she persevered and wrote this book full of kind and encouraging messages. I remember having a similar struggle. For years, I hated my body. Then a few years ago, 
I decided to try showing off a little more of my body when I performed. While it was a real struggle at first, the more I did it and received more overwhelmingly positive response, the more confident I became. Now I love my body. It can be really hard to internalize those positive attitudes, but if you begin by simply doing an outward display of them, it will become so much easier to accept and embrace them. This book is delightfully queer. I felt so much joy when Dennis quoted one of Chicago's greatest drag queens, Shea Coulee. One of this book's greatest strengths is that Dennis provides not only her own voice, but she interviewed many various queer people so that the reader could have a more diverse understanding of the subject. It shows that so many people have gone through so many of the same things as you. You are not alone. Queer Body Power is an important book. It is full of vital messages that queer and plus size youth need to hear because so much of the pain, so much of the trauma that we as queer fat people experienced could have been minimized had we had access to a book like this, something telling us that who we are and how we look is okay. Thank you, Essie Dennis, for providing this book for future generations. As a trans woman, I've been making an effort to discover and read more books by trans authors. Every list I looked up, bar none, always listed Nevada by Imogen Binney. I was surprised to find it on NetGalley since it came out a while ago, but I believe they're now reprinting it with a bigger launch, so that's why they made it available on here. I went into reading Nevada knowing absolutely nothing about it, other than it being a trans classic. Turns out it's about a trans woman who goes on a road trip after ending her relationship and losing her job. The book is written in two parts. Part one describes the events leading up to said road trip, and part two presents an encounter she had on the road. The protagonist, Maria, is painfully unlikable, but in many ways relatable. Her defense mechanism of checking out mentally, struggling to get in tune with her emotions, and even minor day-to-day -day thoughts and interactions felt so authentic to the trans experience. If I'm being honest, the first part of the book was a bit of a bore. I felt like I was spending too much time with Maria's thoughts and could have begun her journey abroad sooner. However, part two of the book is where it really clicked for me. Part two is from the perspective of an egg, a transgender person before they realize they're trans, named James. Initially, I thought James and Maria might even be the same person because of how similar their experiences were. But then Maria shows up like a fairy godmother and takes James on a journey to help crack his egg. This part of the story was phenomenal. I so much loved their conversations, trying to understand each other's identities. Part two alone is an excellent five-star read, and retroactively, I respect that part one was necessary to truly appreciate all the events of the second act. I also just love the way the book ended. While I could see an argument for being disappointing, I felt it was a really appropriate way to end the story. Possibly my favorite part of the book is Maria's blogging, where she attempts to invent new transgender stereotypes. This was hilarious. The generalizations that she made about trans women were spot on and had me cackling on the blue line. I also just uploaded a video reading these stereotypes, so I'll have that linked if you want to listen to that. This reprinting of Nevada features a new afterword by the author. I really valued this section because it contextualizes Binny's influences and inspirations when she went into writing this book. She also discusses her reasons for intentionally setting this book before and after, but not during transition. I hadn't picked up on that as I was reading, but after reading her argument for it, I'm so glad that she wrote it that way. So why is this book considered a classic when it's not even a decade old? Well, a lot has changed in the past 10 years. This book was written before Elliot Page and Caitlyn Jenner publicly transitioned. It even came out before Laverne Cox was on Orange is the New Black. Nevada predates the transgender tipping point. Even now, with the progress we've made, it's still a challenge to get published as a trans author. For Binny to publish this book back then was no small feat. Nevada is a classic and should be read by anyone with an interest in trans literature. 
Now y'all know I am an avid mystery reader. It is by far my favorite genre. But one prevalent issue I've noticed in my many years of reading mysteries is that the genre is hyper heteronormative. Very few series have a queer main character, and even fewer contain proper queer narratives. With this in mind, when I first heard about Mammoth Drop by R.J. Corgan, a mystery set on a gay campground with gays galore, and even a drag queen, I was ecstatic. This is an own voices novel, and the amount of queer rep in this cozy mystery was delightful. Mammoth Drop is about these underground caves where they dig up fossilized mammoth tusks from the permafrost. They're also working on making at least part of this cave system open to the public as a tourist destination. One of the spots on the tour is the titular Mammoth Drop where in the roof of the cave, there's an opening onto the surface, and below the hole, there is just a mountain of mammoth skeletons who had fallen in over the years. This book did something I love, which is when the murder happens in the first chapter, and it was awesome. The victim was pushed through the hole of the mammoth drop and was impaled on a tusk below. <laughs> Damn, that is such a gruesome and vivid image and much more creative than your basic stabbings, shootings, or poisonings. I was really impressed by that. I loved the scenes on the gay campgrounds. There were all sorts of colorful queer characters everywhere. Even one of the police officers was gay and flirting with one of the suspects. <laughs> The drag queen, Maureen Lair, was wonderful. I really enjoyed watching Maureen interact with the patrons and residents, and especially our protagonist, Kay. Maureen provides lots of witty banter and comic relief. I also really appreciated Corgan's allusion to the legendary drag queen, Tandy Amon Dupree, who is known for entering the stage from the rafters, dropping into the splits. There are three protagonists in this book. Kay Wright is our primary protagonist, who studies glaciers and volcanoes, and has solved a handful of murder cases before. She is convinced to visit the drop by its owner, Harry, as well as the other two protagonists, gay couple Carter and Leo. Carter is one of Kay's best friends. He's absurdly wealthy and can afford to live a life just pursuing one doctorate after another. Must be nice. His lover, Leo, is an ex-military guy who now works at the Mammoth Drop. The two of them work together to look for clues until they begin to develop suspicions of each other. I pride myself in my ability to solve mystery novels. However, Mammoth Drop managed to stump me. All of my suspicions fell onto a single character, but that red herring caught me hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Then when the whodunit was revealed, it still made perfect sense for the story. This was a very cozy mystery, but then the big finale got pretty dark. Like, much darker than you would expect from a cozy. I didn't mind it though, and the intensity wasn't drawn out excessively. Overall, I think Mammoth Drop by R.J. Corgan was an excellent, well-paced mystery novel and provided some wonderful queer inclusion in the genre. So there you have the many queer and trans books that I read through NetGalley. Any of these pique your interest? Are you gonna read any of them? Have you found any other good reads through NetGalley? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And if it pleases and sparkles, I'll see you in the next video. Mwah!